Hello, welcome to episode six of The Ox Files, available on the Oxford United official YouTube channel and as a podcast. And we've got a very special guest today. Uh, we often talk about legends being on here, but Mike Ford, Fordy to all of us, he is a legend. Michael, how are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Um, thanks for the invite. I'm really looking forward to it. A uh, bit of reminiscing, a bit of remembering, and, and obviously a bit of mickey taking as well. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm going to save you the bother of telling us about it. Dan, roll VT. United came back with two goals in two minutes. Mike Ford got them both. For those who don't remember Fordy playing, he did this pretty much every week, didn't you, Fordy? Well, I tell my students I do. Yeah, absolutely. What's going through your mind when the second one? What, what are you doing? What? Oh. Oh. Well, if I don't score the first one, I don't, I don't take that chance for that one. Definitely. Oh. And also, I do remember that we used to... Remember there was an Italian football programme on a Saturday morning on Channel 4? Yeah, Galaccio. I watched it in the hotel room and there was goals flying in from everywhere. And, and I think, I genuinely think it impacted on sort of my thought process. Which <laughs> was the first one, it just hit it, because if it misses, it don't really matter. <laughs> um, can I just check as well? So Fordy is the special guest today. I was at that game. I saw you do that. Uh, we're also joined by um, Dan Curtis, who um, has put this whole thing together. Dan, were you at that game? I was at that game. Um, I yeah, I, I remember it vividly. Uh, uh, fantastic, and, unbelievable goals. And uh, for the, I honestly must have dined out on those for weeks and weeks and weeks afterwards, if not years. Um, it's 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 weird because I, I mean to be honest with you, sometimes I don't mention the, my ex, my previous life, <laughs> to my students. Um, and then all of a sudden, after about two months, one of them comes in and says, my granddad knows you. My granddad <laughs> used to watch you play. And I'm like, oh, my God. And then sometimes these two goals get shown and they're going, that's not you, that's not you. Um, but it's really nice. They were, they were in the space of five minutes, basically, in between, I think, the penalty that, that came to scored. Um, so yeah, it was really nice. Um, and it was nice to, to contribute to a point that day. You... Um... The other special guest we have today, uh, lockdown has clearly not been kind, and we joined Harry Potter fans. You're in for a, a treat here. Here comes Albus Dumbledore has joined us today. Martin, that beard is quite... Have you been growing that since 1996? I've been growing it for about four weeks, that's all. It's magnificent. I think so, yeah. If only we I actually bought some beard trimmers the other day, so this is quite neat now. The, the, you need, you, the trimmers aren't going to get a, make a start on that, mate. That's the only <laughs> for that. Um, well, if we're going to mention facial hair and haircuts, uh, Dan, we've got anything on Fordy and his younger... Oh, he was gorgeous, wasn't he? Oh, he's a oh, handsome man. He's a very, very handsome man. Harry. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not lost for words very often. I'm just trying to work out something I can say to describe that lot. Um, um, mixed bag is the word you're looking for. Mixed bag. Well, um, mixed bag and a lot of different hairdressers, I think. Went to <laughs> yeah. one do what I wanted, went to another and so on. So, um, yeah. Some of them, some of them you can explain. I don't think you can explain this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is cruel. <laughs> this is really cruel, isn't it? So, so the moustache, <laughs> there, was, there was a lad, this was at Cardiff, obviously, there was a lad there called Kevin Meacock, and we, we had a bit of a bet about who was the quickest to grow a tash. Um, I'm not sure if I won or not. And then the perm was Kevin Keegan, obviously. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, it doesn't look great, does it? <laughs> <laughs> I promise you. You're going to have a beard, we, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. I promise you that's as stitched up as you're going to get on this. There's, <laughs> there's just good memories. Uh, I thought it was nice and friendly, but it's obviously not turned out that way, has it? Well, so, maybe you're going to tap my haircut. You usually would. Um, well, do you never have a beard, Fordy? Never had a beard. No. Nope. So I, I always like to be sort of relatively clean. And I'll tell you why. I we played. I always used to shave on a Saturday morning, and then this one Saturday morning, I woke up, didn't shave, and we lost three <laughs> one. And I always have a shave then on a Saturday morning. Well, I have to shave my head, or we don't win three one every week. That's that's <laughs> a ritual. Um, Martin, you are the club historian. The start of this season, clearly the summer of nineteen ninety five. Yeah. Tell us in a, bit, uh, a little bit of background for what was going on. 
Okay, well, the previous season, which was our first at uh, what they was called Division Two in those days, I believe, um, after the formation of the Premiership. Um, so our first season was the previous one, 94-95, uh, when in direct contrast to 95-96, we actually started off really well, a top at Boxing Day, and then uh, fell away after losing at home to Wickham of all teams. We kind of fell away and uh, had a slight rally, but we didn't actually finish in the playoff places. We finished seventh that season. Um, and there was quite a lot of behind the scenes stuff going on. Robin Hurd took over as chairman. Um, the club got planning permission for the current ground now and uh, with the expected finish date of 1997. And uh, so there were various changes going on. In terms of player movement, it wasn't a lot. Um, I think that summer saw us bring in uh, Wayne Biggins and uh, Andy Woodman in goal and uh, Mark Angel. Andy Woodman, you're Andy Woodman. years out. Tim uh, Carter. Carter. Tim Carter. Tim Carter. Sure. Yeah, Tim Carter. That's right. Sorry. Uh, so, uh, so not not particularly uh, dramatic uh, player coming in then, but uh, you know they all made a difference. And Mark Angel, especially, I think he had a, a decent influence on the following season. Can I just um, interrupt the Oxford United podcast? Go and seek out the podcast with Woody Andy Woodman. I have never laughed as much as a podcast of, with, with him talking about uh, his playing days. He, he's some boy, that boy. Fordy, can I ask a quick question? The season before had been a bit of a disappointment. You'd, you'd been top at Christmas and then kind of fallen away a bit. Was there a bit of a hangover at the start of this season? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you what happened in the previous one. And I was playing centre-half with Matty Elliott. And um, I got injured and I missed about six months. And I, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but that coincided with us dropping out of playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> um, ge no, ge genuinely, me and Matt were playing together. I remember going to Bradford, winning 2-0, and then we went to Huddersfield in 1-4-3. And um, I think Rogie was playing left back. And we, we seem to have the mix of a promotion team. Um, and then I did, I did get injured. I missed a lot of that season. And... When I came back for the following preseason, I literally had done nothing. And Dennis pulled me in one day and said, I need to know if you're going to be fit. And I said, Gaffer, I don't know. And he said, well, you need to find out. And I went out and ran, and, and I ran pain three, and, and I was able to be fit for that season. Um, whether it had a hangover or not, I, I'm not sure, Dan. Um, again, it's a long time ago. I can't remember us having a conversation in preseason about how disappointed we were on the outcome of the previous one. I just think as a group of people, we came in and, and got tried to get on with it, but we weren't quite doing as, as well as we could. And we were just treading water, really, for a long period of that season. Well, um, everyone remembers you as a left-back, primarily, but you had played midfield, I think, for Cardiff, as well as centre-back all over the place. What were you, by the summer of 95, did you see yourself as a centre-back? Um... Not, I, I enjoy playing centre-back, actually, because you don't get exposed for a lack of pace as often as you would do as a full-back. And I was, I was OK at reading the game, so I could get around Matty and I could get around whoever else I was playing with. But I did like to get forwards and help out the attack. And from centre-half, that's difficult. Um, I, think being, I think being what they call a utility player in my early career really helped. Um, the season, I, my final season at Cardiff when I was 20, 21 and we got promotion, if I hadn't have been that versatile, I probably wouldn't have gotten a team at the start. And I got in because of an injury to another player and I did well. And when he was fit, somebody else got left out and I shifted into a different position. Um, left back. I mean, midfield was a bit too quick for me, I think, probably, especially in the championship. It, it, genuinely, it was. I couldn't see stuff quick enough. Um, so I played backwards and sideways too much and probably just got it forwards when I, did, when I could see it forward. So seeing the game from left back or centre half really suited me. But I did enjoy getting forwards, I must admit. But the, the one thing I would observe, I don't mean this in any horrible way to you, Michael, I'm not winding you up. You, Matty, well, no, I'm genuinely um, not, but you, <laughs> Anton Rogan, Les Robinson and Matty, the one thing we could do with in that back four is a bit of pace. And I think Phil Gilchrist obviously was a perfect fit to come into that. Yeah, I, I mean, to, to be fair, Phil and Matty complemented each other brilliantly because 
you know, Matty was what he was, and Phil had really good pace. Um, and that that extra bit of pace that Phil brought to the back four really helped. So he could probably play a little bit higher. Um, I mean, in those days, we didn't really have sweeper keepers. Um, so again, Rob, Robbo, tenacious, bit of pace, Matty, cultured, never lost a header, Gilly, at it, loads of pace. And I just did my bit on the other side as well. So at the back four, you know, we did complement each other really well. We'll better have a look at some action. Dan, what have we got? You're, you're generally the man who talks us through the videos. What have we got first? Well, where else to start? First day of the season, nice sunny day, Chesterfield at home. Um, quite a tight game, as I recall. Any any recollections, Fordy? Uh, um, oh, not really. Only because I might have watched this about three months ago. Steve, Steve Woods playing a, at the start yeah. of the season. And also, Timmy Carter only came in because Phil Whitehead was injured. So I think we had Tim on loan from Bristol Rovers. But I don't remember this game, no. There's the winner, Chris sure. Allen. Does, uh, yeah. Really, really neat finish. Um, not something you associate necessarily with Chrissy Allen. What was he like to play with, Fordy? You were quite often behind him as, as the teams lined yeah. up. A long way behind him, yeah. Um, I, Cr Chrissy is, was an old school wide player. So in those days, if you were left footed, you played on the left. And if you were right footed, obviously you played on that side. And Chrissy cutting in. So if he cut in and I tried to overlap, he never passed it to me. He'd shoot and would dribble out for a goal kick. So at some point, you have to decide, do I go or do I not? And I'd probably just support it from behind him because he was very quick, Chrissy, very direct. And also, if I've gone past and he's lost it, we're both out of the game. So you, you sort of learn to play with different types. And Chrissy was direct, left-footed, strong, um, and got his fair share of goals. What was the plan with Joey? Because Joey was going to cut inside and then put it in the top corner. That's fine, isn't it? Well, I mean, Martin might be able to spread some light on it. I think Joey joined. Did Joey join partway through this season? Yeah, he came back uh, in November, I think it was. Because Dennis, to be fair, Dennis, I was his, his captain, but he, he very rarely called me in for a chat or a, you know, a consultation or whatever you want to call it. And he actually called me in one day and he said, what do you think about getting Joey back? And I said, crikey, bookmakers would be really pleased. You know, that would be chuffed a bit. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I went, I'd get him back at the drop of a hat because he's different. He loves the club. He really never wanted to leave. He'd love to come back. And I think he could give us an extra dimension, playing on the right, left-footed, going past people, scoring goals from distance, create. You know, Joey was a, a I think Joey could have played for England. If he'd have stuck West Ham out a bit longer, we'll never know. But he had that ability and he was different. And I think in every team, I call him a maverick. I, I think you need one. You need somebody who's different. Who sometimes you go, do you know what? He's contributed zero. The next week he wins you the game. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, right. Four okay, yeah, 40, if you've got a pen and paper, there's a, there's a uh, quiz that runs through the, uh, through the episode. Uh, this is the first question, following on from that first game of the season. Is this an easier quiz than your previous quizzes? I think it is easier. Others might disagree. They're all easy if you know the answers, let's face it. Oh. <laughs> so the first question anyway, is only seven or eight questions. First question is this. Chrissy Allen obviously scored the opening goal of the season against Chesterfield. But how many goals for Oxford United did he score in total for his career at Oxford? So he, he never came back, did he? Chris, he never came back as a, came back as a coach, player. didn't he? So, ooh, that yeah, he left the forest. Yeah. Ordy, we do the answers right at the end, okay? So you're yeah. not told, yeah. yeah. I mean, I reckon. So yeah. I can get, I can get the photo. Okay, I'm like, okay, cool. <laughs> I'm going to have a side bet. Ordy, I'm going to offer you double figures, yes or no. I'll give you that chance. Do you think he got double figures? Yeah, I think he got double figures, yeah. He must have I, bet, I bet it's under double figures. We'll come back to that one. Okay. Certainly will. He got a few this season, actually, Chris. I'm just going to I'm yeah. gonna throw that little hint out there. I spoke to him yeah. last week. He'll, be, he'll definitely be watching this. So, no, he never got double figures. <laughs> <laughs> right. Next game we're going to show is uh, this one. Uh, so yeah, this is Swindon. Good. Swindon who are flying at the time. We were having a bit of a mediocre start to the season, um, but Swindon are absolutely flying. 
you should tell people who are watching on the podcast as well that you can go on the YouTube and watch these videos. But, uh... United magician was young Bobby Ford. He seems to have all the skills. So there's Bobby Ford. Ford, in no relation of yours, but a hell of a player, wasn't he? At the other end, United... Yeah, Bob, Bob was... Um... I, I really like Bob. He's a fella as well. Um, he was obviously young. He had so much ability. Um, but he came across sometimes. Just, he just didn't care. But he did. Look what you just did then. <laughs> you just yeah, nodded. Yeah. I feel that's a goal saver there. Well, it's, it's, as a defender, it's almost as good as a goal, isn't it, really? I, I, do, I, mem I remember this game like it was yesterday because me and Dennis had a row at half time about it. Paul Moody. Because <laughs> I think we, we got a free kick on the edge of just about here with about a minute to go. We all went up and I, I said to me, just kick it and just blazed it into the car park. And um, that was a wasted opportunity, but then Moody, I think, got the equaliser. Moody, who'd had this incredible start to the previous season, had then went through quite a sticky patch. I know he had some personal issues, um, but did you always believe he was going to start scoring goals properly again, Fordy? I, do you know what? Moody's Moody, Moody quite a fellow. I was unaware of, of some issues he might have had at that time. At that time, I, I think we all genuinely hoped he would start scoring again because the pre I think, did he get a hat trick at Cardiff the previous season? Where That's he right, yeah. Scoring all three goals, he must have beat about forty players. Yeah. Um, but he was he was moves was like a gentle giant. Um, we we were just desperate for him to start scoring because we we knew how important he was to the team. Um, I think this team was managed. Was it managed by Steve McMahon? Yes, yeah, it was at that time. Yes. Um, yeah, it would have been. Yeah. And, and I and I I do remember. I don't know if it was this game. But it, McMahon was on, the, on their bench because he played, I think, a bit as well um, when he first became their player manager. And he threw the ball at Robbo to take a throw in and he threw it in an aggressive way. And Robbo went half volley it back and he's like dived in the back of the dugout to get out of the way and Robbo obviously never did. And, um, and I actually, because I lived in Swindon, um, I actually bumped into Steve McMahon often and all he wanted to talk about was football. <laughs> So passionate about it and what a good player he was. But yeah, I mean, I think at this time the, the two teams are quite equal. I think previously Swindon probably had the better of it over a number of seasons. I remember I think Joey played for Swindon in this game. Um, and I remember the Oxford fans being divided whether to boo him or cheer him because obviously he's playing for Swindon. Um, when we went back there with Joey. He's talked about it on one of these before, hasn't he? He got kicked from pillar to post. That's what right. The yeah. temptation if you play against him, then he's coming on in the Swindon shirt to put him in the stand at all. Well, I I, I remember that game again. I think I think it was McMahon telling the players to get into him. Yeah. Because I think he felt Joey had let him down, or Joey was a bit soft, or something. And, and it was it was concentrated. I mean, it was somebody like Ian Colbrack, who I know quite well, lovely fella, was kicking lumps out of him. I'm like, where's that come from? Yeah. So I just think a message had, had got to those players to, to make Joey's afternoon or evening as difficult as they could be. Yeah. So we get away with this, we get a one all draw, and then I suspect, Dan, you're going to guide us more for the second half of the season rather than... Yeah, the last. second half of the season is <laughs> a lot more exciting, to be honest. But, I mean, here we are after 15 games. Here's the league table. And we are properly mid-table. We were 14th there. We've won four, drawn six, lost five. Goal difference of, of zero. It's looking pretty uninspiring at this point. Was there frustration for the in the camp? Well, again, um, I remember... The, so... The game away at Shrewsbury, we lost 2-0. I think Phil Gilchrist handballed one for a penalty. And it was one of those where you just think, why have you done that? So we came in on the Thursday and Dennis called a meeting. And um, he said to, to Gilly about why he did it. And Gilly, Gilly started to reason it. And Stuart Massey went, told him to shut up. He said, we need to stop making excuses as a team because we're good enough to be in the top five and we're mid-table, we're going nowhere. And Stuart was really passionate about it. I, I remember it. He, 
he didn't get us going, but he was exactly right. Everything he said was right. We were full of excuses. There was reasons not to do something. And we had to remember what we were. We were an honest group of footballers with a bit of talent here and there. And we were, we were nowhere near it. And, and that might have been where, where it wasn't a turning point. But I think there was a realisation that we weren't quite doing as well as we should be. There's also a few changes to the team as this season goes on. And we, we talk a lot about David Rush and uh, moods and people up front. At the start of the season, I spotted in this as well, Wayne Biggins is playing games. And um, I remember a couple of seasons before this, maybe Martin, I think Marco Gabbiadini coming in. We'd get in... <laughs> We bring in big name-ish strikers for our division. For some reason or other, it just didn't click for them, did it? No, that's right. Um, one of the players who joined partway through this season, uh, obviously Joey, but it was Martin Aldridge, who I think had a, a great impact on the team. Yeah, and and he's not one of the star names, is he? He's no, from, right. from Northampton, maybe, or someone. Yeah, I think I think Chris, that's very apt because Wayne Biggins played in the top division, definite Man City. Marco Gabbiadini was was Dennis's love child, and he'd had a really and he'd had a really good career. So you you ask the question, why are they coming to play for us? And that's not being disrespectful to us as a club and a group of footballers, but why? The difference with Martin Aldridge was he wanted to come because he wanted to play football. He wanted to show he could score goals in someone's first team. And when you talk about turning points, his arrival coincided with our upturn in performances and results. Um, obviously, the run at the end of the season, he was instrumental in that, getting the winner at Carlisle, scruffy's goal, which is what he got. And um, I think the reason was he was motivated. He wanted to come, wanted to be part of it, and um, he wanted to score some goals. You are a well, self-motivated team. Oh, this is good. Um, podcasters, we're now looking at Oxford United playing Dorchester in the FA Cup, which is... Um, is that how... Oh, I, I sense a Brodetsky question coming. Is this there how... Is a question coming after this, for sure. But, uh, Somebody tell me... Uh, I hope this isn't your question. Was it an Oxford goalkeeper or an ex-Oxford goalkeeper playing for them? No, Ken Vasey was playing for them. And uh, I think he was very bad of the match. So even though they conceded nine goals, I think they could have conceded a lot more if they hadn't had Ken Vasey. Tap that, one. Who's tapped that one at the back post. What uh, are you doing up there, Fordy? <laughs> um... Do you know what? I've got, it's a great, I've got a story. So we were 9-0 up and I got the first goal. So in my head, I've got the winner. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, in the last minute, Phil Gilchrist brought some down for a penalty. That's so right. that then then, I didn't get the winner. It was, I was fuming with Gilly after the game. <laughs> Absolutely fuming with him, but it was just one of those days. Normally clubs can make it really difficult for an yeah. inside. But for some reason, we just got on a roll and, and scored a lot of goals. You also didn't give up. Often I see teams get four or five and think, OK, we'll take it easy on the part-timers. It's not your mentality, is it? Well, it, it's... I mean, I always I always look at these games as show the opposition why you're a full-time professional, why you get paid to do the job you do, and why you turn up to train every day. And I think today we did. I think sometimes the gap between non-league and... and full-time clubs, although there are a lot of full-time clubs now in the league, isn't quite as big as it, it should be at times in games. But we, we showed that you know, we were the full-time team for, on, on this occasion. You mentioned a minute ago, Fordy, about players with a point to prove. You look somewhere in the middle of all this, there's people like Mark Angel, David Rush, not necessarily big names, but fantastic. Well, David Rush's attitude, we'll come on to that, I'm sure, but they want to play, they want to prove themselves. Yeah, it's, um, I think as a club, that's what we always were. So Dennis signs Matty Elliott. We'd never heard of him, but he wanted to make the step up. He wanted to play for the club. Um, I never left because I wanted to, well, never left because nobody wanted me, I suppose. But, you know, I, I had no reason to leave because I wanted to be there. Maybe Robbo was the same. And, and a lot of the players, you know, if you talk to them, they might express the feel that it was the best period of their career yeah. that they enjoyed. Because the, the year after we go up, until we sell Matty, we were challenging in around the top 10. It was ridiculous. And we didn't do it based on ability, well, a little bit, but we, we did it because we were together. 
I remember this day being absolutely livid because we'd won 9-1 and we weren't the biggest winners of the day. I think Shrewsbury beat somebody 11-1. You know, like there's always the big winner in the FA Cup and they always say, oh, you know, today's big winners were Oxford United who thrashed Dorchester 9-1. But we, we didn't even get mentioned on the news I didn't because Shrewsbury go. stuck 11 past someone and I was I really cross about even, that. I didn't even go because we had to pay to get in. It wasn't part of our season ticket. I thought, ah, we'll win that. I didn't know we were going to get the record score, so... So it's a double part of this one, really, two points. Uh, the 9-1 win is the biggest margin of victory still is since the club joined the Football League. But uh, United's best win since turning professional in 1949 is bigger than this. And, uh, and the club's biggest win in its history, which is in non league days. Uh, so questions are, what is United's best win since turning professional? And what is the club's biggest win? Back to reality. Back to reality. So yeah. this is the table from uh, January the 20th, where we lost 1-0 away at Chesterfield, which I took my then girlfriend to, and it was the coldest day in the history of mankind. Um, and we looked terrible that day. We looked absolutely terrible. My, my girlfriend at the time was absolutely livid. She's like, what are we doing watching this rubbish? <laughs> Um, you left that hanging. Hang on, hang on. Your girlfriend at the time is she now Mrs. Curtis? No, she's not. No. <laughs> Do you think what you just told us had an influence? Well, I, yeah, we didn't last long after that. I have to say, so I blame <laughs> Forty really for that. Not really surprised by that. So we're halfway through the season here. Just over. she's now a banker as well. So uh... <laughs> say no more. <laughs> um, so yeah, Forty, it could have been really rich if it wasn't for your lot being rubbish that day. Um, but we're so this is after 24 games, we are still utterly mid table. This is in January as well, right? This is still really frustrating, I guess. Um, again, we we thought we probably, I mean, it looks like there's been no advancement of our season at all, does it? Apart from the goal difference going up, and you can clearly see there lack of goals is the issue. Um, because goals for one again is pretty decent. Um is it, was it 46 games in those days? Yeah, it was, yeah. So we're not quite at the point where we went on that ridiculous run, but we are getting towards it, aren't we? Coming up, we started off potentially a few days later where we win 2-0 at Burnley. Yeah, I did play in this one. <laughs> <laughs> the turning point. <laughs> My birthday, actually. I remember this. I was in the pub. And they got home, first, switched on CFAX, and we'd won. Yeah. yeah, that was our first away win for a long time, I think. Or first away yeah. win of the season, maybe? It yeah, was. first one of the season, actually, yeah. yeah. Younger fans were playing Burnley away, and now it seems ridiculous. They're an established Premier League club. They weren't quite the force that they, they are now. So were you dropped, Fordy, or injured? or well, Suspended. Um, Marshy, Marshy came into the team and then I played every game and I was the captain and um, we won there and we then go to Rotherham and Dennis keeps faith with Simon which you can probably understand and then he, we, I think we were losing there 1-0 or something we lost there 1-0 he put me on really late and then I played the next one and that was it then so. Yeah, I also went to Rotherham, I think potentially with that girlfriend as well. I was living in Hull at the time and I was uh, only mainly going to Northern matches and we lost just about every game up north, apart from Burnley, which uh, I didn't go to. Um, but we are now, uh, so this is for, for people listening, we are now at Carlisle, which probably was the turning point of the season. Um, what 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 was said before the game? Can you remember for the what what kicks what kick started the season? Do you think? Um, sometimes being away from home, being on a coach for so long, and you've got to bear in mind Carlisle is well, it's almost Scotland. Um, it, we were together a long time that day, so I can imagine we trained, went have some lunch somewhere, jumped on the coach, played cards in the hotel together. Got up pre match, got to the game, um, 1 0 down. It's a long way to go, boys, to, to jump back on that coach. And do you know what some of it was? It was about the trip back. Let's, you know, let's have something to enjoy on the way back. And then Matty does this. And then Martin, I think, Nick's won it right at the death. And, and that got us. And I do think we would, we would have had a few drinks on the way back. We'd have fallen off the coach. 
and we'd be going, right, where's the next one? That's a typical Martin Aldridge goal to win it as well, six yard box. And that was really late on as well, wasn't it? That was that yeah. almost the last kick of the match. Yeah, pretty uh, much. One of the things I love doing about this podcast is exploring what's on YouTube. And there's so much good stuff, but I'd never seen this angle of Matt Elliott's goal before. Um, and it looks even better from this angle. Yeah, it does actually. Yeah. If you, um, people who can't see, it's the ones who we're watching, look at the away end back there. It's not even anywhere near half full because the momentum, when we get on to a game of crew later in the season, we're queuing for an hour and a half before we get into the ground to fill up the away end. This is where it all starts. So we win away at Carlisle and this is when momentum means so much, I think. Yeah, I, think I, was in, I, was in, I was in the radio Oxford studio for this game because they wanted to interview a fan about Oxford United's appalling away record. And so uh, they didn't have um, live commentary back then. So they just had goal updates. So they had, rang a little bell in the studio when a goal went in. And uh, so uh, there was me and Paul Beasley, I think. And uh, when they, um, obviously, when they rang the bell first, when uh, Carlisle went ahead and uh, gave them lots of nice, juicy, sort of like, oh, Oxford are doing it again, blowing it away from home. But then when uh, first Matty Elliott and then right at the death, Martin Aldridge goals went in, uh, the, the whole atmosphere changed. And uh, it was just, uh, I can't remember who we were talking to now, but there was uh, a real, everyone in that radio office studio suddenly was laughing and joking and chatting rather than sort of like being morose and depressed. It was great. Which starts but, a real run. I think, I also think that those supporters that did travel, that jump in their car, you know, one driver and one of the passengers seat two in the back, they've got to drive as far as we have to go back on the coach. And they want to, they, they probably enjoyed it massively talking about the game. And then what you start doing then is you start looking at your upcoming fixtures. We can win that one, we can do this. And all of a sudden, everyone feels, oh, this feels much better. This feels like a successful football team. And instead of looking back over your shoulder at something that has happened, you're looking forward to something that might happen. And I think those supporters and the group of players that jumped on that coach were all of the same opinion. If, if we get a couple more wins, we could be right back in it or be in it. Not back in it, but be in it. But at this stage, how was Moods back? Because later in his career, he had to have like his own sleeping area in the bus because he had to lie down basically for travel. Was he, was he able to move at this stage? Well... There was, there, there was, I don't know if it was this one, but he didn't play. So it makes me think it was where Moose come into training on a Monday morning. And um, he talked to us about, he bought a canoe <laughs> at a car boot sale. A <laughs> he, he bought a canoe at a car boot sale. And uh, he came in the next Monday and we said, did you, did you take the canoe out? He went, no, no, I, I had to sell it at a car boot sale, so I couldn't get in it. <laughs> so he bought it, tried to get into it, couldn't, and then had to resell it. <laughs> so, so this, this, so that's just a, a sort of a, a scenario of, of what moves was like. But I think he became ill overnight for this trip. We left him in the hotel. We picked him up on the way back. And it was about nine o'clock. He's lying flat out somewhere, not great. About <laughs> nine o'clock, he lifted his head and went, how do we get on today, boys? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we won, Moots. Can you tell? <laughs> um, but I think, um, yeah, that, that was definitely an away trip at Carlisle. And he didn't play then. So I'm, I'm thinking it might be that, this game here. But he come back in, didn't he, Moots? And he got a hat full of goals towards the end of that season. Well, they can I ask a question again? Um, I was all the way through the season. I was thinking we are underachieving here. This is a really, really good squad. You look at, you know, you talk about the spine of a team. It, this team had a brilliant spine. You also had Joey Beecham who's coming into a form. You had Paul Moody up front. You had David Rush who's just a bundle of energy. You had, as I said, Matt Elliott at the back. You had a great goalkeeper. And that we were just mentioning, you know, we're 14th, 15th in the table. Was there real frustration? Was there, did you look around the camp and think we should be doing much better than this? Well, if you, if you compare the previous season where we, we'd had a fantastic start and I think in the top five at it, you know, Christmas time, we've gone almost a year, being average, 
you know, we've gone 12 months of being average footballers, an average football team, not capable of putting a run together to, to accumulate a number of points to, to go up a table. So I don't necessarily think we looked around and went, you know, we're underachieving. I think we were trying to get to somewhere where we could grab hold of it and go momentum. Mm. You know, so we've won it Burnley, we've won it Carlisle. We, I think we won it home against Walsall just prior to this. So all of a sudden, you know, that trip back, that goal that Matthew scored, the, you know, the, the Snickers goal that Martin gets, it, it was something for us to grab hold of. It was, oh, okay, this is what it's like to start winning games of football again on a regular basis because probably we couldn't remember it because it had been so long. Um, so this is, uh, we won shortly afterwards at Bournemouth and that was the first time I think we, we crept into the top six and we were still a long way off the top two at this point. Um, we're, what, 11 points off and we're in March. So I, I was thinking playoffs at this point, I must admit. Um, but then the amazing run starts and probably this game at Swindon's super important in that as well. You're smiling for the, tell us why. Um, because it was a local derby, um, because we thumped them, you know, I, I know, I know they hit a crossbar at a crucial time and probably Phil's made a couple like, there you go. Um, and Joey scoring the third goal right in front of their fans was, for me, was brilliant. And then, um, again, in those days, you could celebrate and we went over the road and we were in the pub till three o'clock in the morning. And um, it was just an amazing night. It really was. It was an amazing night. We beat the top side comfortably. Joey gets the winner. We celebrate. And as I've said, it was like, this is great. This is what winning games of football is all about. Brilliant for Joey. Absolutely chuffed the bits for him. Doing that in front of their fans. We probably booed him when he did his shoelaces up. So um, vindication to get him back. Um, and I think that game probably gave us that complete belief that we could do something because we just turned over the top side 3 0 comfortably. Someone who lived in Swindon, uh, they used to get a lot of grief from the locals there. No, honestly, Mark, mine, they, they were um, probably because they didn't know who I was most of the time, but we, you know, I had a, I had a nice, a nice little local I could go into, and they were good as they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Um, never had any problems at all, to be honest, um, which, which, is, which is nice because I know in the modern day with social media, it is difficult to get away from it. But um, no, I'm, it was, um, they, were, they were good to me. So that was nice to beat them. That was nice to beat them. <laughs> Another question then. Uh, hopefully this one might be a bit easier for you. Simple, simple as this. Why is United's biggest win against Swindon? Do you mean this is a simple one? Well, if you know the answer, it's simple. <laughs> <laughs> We're flying by this point. Um, and here's here we are, thumping Burnley 5-0. I say thumping, I remember us being played off the pitch for pretty much most of the second half, apart from the last 10 minutes when there's an absolute flurry of goals. Yeah, I, I'm... I mean, we beat, did we beat Shrewsbury six as well at home? Yeah. This, or, uh, later on, yeah. It's just, you have to tough it out in games. And, and we we toughed it out because we kept the score at 1-0. We didn't let them score. We mm -hmm. kept it like that because we knew at this point we were capable of scoring goals. And if we just kept it tight, somebody, and, and they did, we scored four extra goals. And um, it does feel like a thumping and looks like a thumping, but... Even five minutes are difficult at, at times in a game. But it's, I think we just had belief. We, you know, we, we just believed at this point we could do something. There were so many things to get really excited about around this point in the season. Joey was banging in goals, having had a bit, a bit of a dodgy start to his comeback to us. Um, Moody was absolutely flying. Everything is touching was flying into the net. Um, I really started to believe around this point in the season, I must admit. And yet... And yet, and Fordy will have to get them out of this, there were fans of us still not having Martin Gray and David Smith as a midfield two. And we never talk about that, those two. We always talk about the wingers and Moody and the defence and everything. But they, they won us promotion, those two. 
Well, did did we sell Bobby Ford or was Bobby still around as a squad player? We sold him. I think we had to sell him, I think, by then. Yeah, right, okay. yeah. I think Bobby Ford was there for a season or two longer, but uh, definitely he wasn't playing in the run-in. I think possibly he was injured at the time, but I'm sure he played for us in the championship the following season or whatever it was called then. I think with with Martin, I mean, we, 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 didn't, we as players didn't know him, but, but obviously Dennis did. And Dennis trusted him. And I think as a manager, if you trust a player to go and do what you want them to do, expect them to do, then, then I think you've got a nice relationship. And Martin had no frills to his game, neither did Dave. But is it coincidental they played together during that run? It's probably not. It gave protection to the centre half. It gave protection to the back four. It probably allowed me to get on a little bit. Um, and, and it's it's not about Paul Moody or, or Matt Elliott or Dave Smith. It's about the groups within the group. So the back four, the midfielders, the wide players. It's about working cohesively, being a group that understands each other. So if I give the ball to Martin Gray, I don't expect him to get it out of his feet, drop the shoulder and stick it 70 yards to Joey. I expect him to keep the football. Um, and then I expect him when we lose it to win it back. So um, I think job descriptions were quite easy. And um, like I said, it, it, you know, if, if the two lads played together, David and um, Martin, in that run-in, then it clearly worked. You know, I, I don't, you know, both lads, top lads, come into the group, um, helped, and, you know, and especially David was there a little bit longer, um, really helped the group. Another question. What makes that Burnley game, the 5 0 win, unique in United's history? One thing happened in that game, it's never happened any other time. Oh. <laughs> Move on. Move on. So think about that. I'm not thinking about it. I'll leave it to Ford. He can have that point. If he gets it. <laughs> now, this was the day that Matt Elliott didn't play. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, Fordy. Um, yeah, I think Matty must have must have been suspended. Must have been. Yeah. Um, and Steve, Steve Wood obviously played, and and you don't think about it at the time, but great cross. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, um, but you don't think about the pressure that was on Steve to play that game because we were on a fantastic run. Matty was our linchpin. You know, he was the. You know, he was our go-to fella, stick him in from 40 yards, you know, win headers in both boxes. And probably if you look at us defensively on that day, we, we weren't as good as we, we had been. And, you know, I think it was just coincidental that uh, Steve played it. You can't, you know, we were probably quite thankful Matty was going to play the next one, but just because it was Matty, not because Steve was going to get left out. You know, Steve had played in the top division. Um, and it was just one of those games. But the most important thing was that we didn't lose the next one. I know people talk about how to win the next one. You know, I've experienced times in my managerial career where we've lost heavily and you just had to keep a clean sheet in the next one. Because if we hadn't, and we might have lost, all that momentum that we'd built up over a number of weeks probably would have evaporated. So the next, the next game was so important for us to keep a clean sheet and not to lose. Next game was a nil-nil draw against Wrexham, which I did go to. I remember it being really, really frustrating. But as Fordy says, you know, it was a clean sheet and a point. Um, here's the table after that Wrexham game. Uh, with, what, seven games left, we are still some way off the top two. A long way off Blackpool, who were top at the time. Um, again, we're, I, I was thinking playoffs. And I fancied our chances in the playoffs as well, because I thought we were such a good team. Yeah, again, I, I don't think we looked at, at the league t tables much, if at all. Um, it was just about the next game. We, we knew, I think we knew we'd come so far in a very short space of time. We didn't want to blow it. And, and sometimes that leads to protecting mm. those results. So rather than winning, you don't want to get beat. And if you try not to get beat, you do end up getting beat, but you don't win because you draw games. So I think... Maybe that loss at Stockport helped because it meant we had to keep winning. Draws weren't enough. 
So that was our object. Next game, although it was a draw, after that one, you know, we, we have to win. It was almost like, you know, people talk about FA Cup finals, don't they? But we had to win all those games. The next game, Blackpool, who just mentioned, who are 13 points clear of us at the time. We're, to, to set the scene for us, Fordy, what happened in the match? I've, I've, I wasn't at this game, so uh, I, I don't have any idea what happened apart from the last minute. What was the, what was the match like itself? Um, tense. Remember it being a really tight affair um, and probably one goal was going to win it. Um, we, we were, I didn't feel we ever felt threatened by them. Um, we showed them an enormous amount of respect because obviously... Um, but we had belief if we did it properly, we could win the game. And, and um, you know, we probably didn't expect Joey to fire in a 30 yard looping volley like he did to win us here. But it did. And um, again, it gives you a lift. Despite being on a fantastic run, every single thing you can grab hold of, which gives you some belief, that goal, that victory, that clean sheet, um, we held on to it. Um, you know, you can see the. You know, at the end of the game, it was probably relief. I think we, we, you know, big deep breath, puffed the cheek, shook the hand for the opposition. It was relief. We got across the line, and then we could actually go forwards into other games that we would be expected to win with complete confidence and no fear. More importantly, no fear. Yeah, you've got no fear, but the teams above you, Swindon, Blackpool, are starting to look over their shoulder because we're, well, in my memory, we win every game from between now and the end of the season. Or, we become almost unstoppable. It's just a question of whether we've left ourselves too much to do. Yeah, po possibly. Um, I think this story has been well documented. That um, it was Sam Allardyce and Phil Brown, wasn't it? The management yeah. duo there, and Phil Brown did the uh, the after match interview and, and suggested that we would be very good in the playoffs and would be a, a dark horse to go up. Um, obviously inferring that he didn't expect us to finish in the top two. Um, when we did finish in the top two, we spent a week in, in Mallorca and uh, <laughs> we sent him a postcard. I, I remember sitting down about 11 o'clock in the morning, ran a ball, and I think they'd, they were either going to play Bradford or they played Bradford. And they, I think they were going to play Bradford. And I, you know, we as a group thought it'd be quite nice to send Phil Brown a postcard from <laughs> Mallorca on the beach, enjoying ourselves. Wishing him good luck in the playoffs. So um, again, it, it's a, it's amazing how somebody says something as flippant as he did, and how much a group of players can latch onto it and go, right, this is another reason we've got to keep winning games. We need to prove him wrong. So all those little bits at this point added up to something really big and tangible, and, and we were on a roll. Any sort of mischief, you're in the middle of it, Mike Ford. You still are. What's next, Dan? Where are we going next? Another uh, question. Hey. So that goal by Joey was voted um, the best ever scored at the Manor by United supporters. Uh, that was uh, obviously after we moved on to the new stadium. Um, so about four years after that game, Joey won another accolade from a fans poll. Uh, what did he win? Oh, so that again. What other accolade did Joey win from a fans poll at the well, basically the end of that decade, at the end of the sort of the 2000s, end of the 90s? Marvellous. Ah, uh, is this a derby? Isn't it a derby? It's we, not we, a derby, it's Wickham away for those who are on the podcast. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what division Wickham are in, even uh, these days, but uh, we travelled to Adams Park and uh, the entire away end of Bet on Matt Elliott for the first goal, so he was something like 20 to 1. Seams, as they say. Limbs, I think it's called, Chris. <laughs> now, how many goals did we score that season from corners? I mean, what a routine it was. I know we've mentioned it in the previous pod with Joey, but I mean, how good were we from set pieces, Mike? Well, if you look at moves and you look at Massey and... You know, I went up for them, and you had Stuart who scored. You know, we, we were a threat, and, and more importantly, we had good delivery. So, um, you know, Joey probably took most of them. It's not something that we probably worked on massively. You know, we didn't spend hour after hour doing it on a Friday morning. 
Um, but if you get the delivery right, we knew Matty could probably dominate his opponent. Moose could dominate his opponent. And if there was a couple of scraps to be had, you'd, you'd probably feed off them. But yeah, they're, they're, they are crucial. Set pieces are crucial at both ends. But that was um, that was a great day. That was a really good day, that was. Um, yeah, to this it's... photograph. Tell us about Moody's um, cartwheel or handstand or whatever it was. Every time he did it, I cringed. I thought, you know, <clears throat> his body can't take that, surely. When did he first do it for thee? Or when did he do, did he do it in training? Um, it was just, Moods, Moods just occasionally did something out of character. Um, and that was out of character. So when we first saw it, we were like, Moods, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and he probably realised that it put a smile on. Obviously, scoring puts a smile on your face, but then the sort of cartwheel handstand celebration of those goals also added to it. So it was just something that, you know, you look at it and go, yeah, well, I don't quite know what that was all about, but it just added to the spectacle, added to the feel-good factor probably around, around us at that time. I've never asked you about another iconic image from this season or the one before maybe. Martin Aldridge scores a goal, clearly gets injured in the build-up to it. He's down on all fours, clearly in a lot of pain, and the pictures of you with your arms aloft sat on him. What were you thinking? Um, well, it was right in front of our fans, wasn't it? Yes. I, don't, I mean, if Martin scored, obviously he's playing up front, unless it was a set piece, I don't think it was. I'm trying to work out why I was sort of <laughs> toward that end of the pitch to be able to do that. It, it, you do dab things, don't you? You, yeah. you do things you look back on and go, why did I do that? Um, and that's probably one of them. Can I ask you another question? Because obviously I was moaning at you all from the Ulster Road. These two were in the other stands. All I remember, nearly every game, you geeing up the fans, giving it, come on, get behind us. Get... Was that an instinctive thing or something you felt like you had to do as captain? It's probably a bit of both, actually. It was so, it was so I mean, like, when you look at the, the premiership games or, or the league games on the telly at the moment, no fans, it's, it's just not real football. Um, and, it, and teams are suffering. Um, and, and I think the fans play a massive part. And, you know, when you hear a, a manager talk about, you know, the fans sucking the ball in the goal from behind that goal, it, it's, it's genuinely true. They, they can inspire you to go over and above and beyond what you're capable of doing. Because you as an individual or a team, you know, they're an important part and you understand that. And it, it just, and it can intimidate the opposition as well. And I know the Manor wasn't a massive place, but all those fans packed into that, that little stand, you know, behind the goal down the Manor end. Um, it, it, it could, it could upset people at times. And if it can help, then, then you try and use it. Reply. Here's the game you referenced earlier, Cordy. The 6 0 against Shrewsbury. So, this is with uh, three games of the season left. Um, we're just brilliant. We're flying at this point. Was this a midweek game? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. I have a horrible feeling there's a Martin question coming at the end of this, and I know the answer already. Is there a question at the end of this, Martin? There is, and you do know the answer already. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Everybody else, watch this carefully. Watch the goals carefully, because I know the question that's coming. If you're listening on the podcast, <laughs> yes, tough, basically. It's um... if you're on the podcast, just make up a random answer like all the other questions. That's true, like you always do. I think if you look at the team, if you look at the personnel in the team, the team's changed a bit. Um, the, the probably only part of the team that hasn't is the back four. Mm -hmm. Stuart Mass has come into the team. Joey's playing on the left there. Moose is playing up with uh, Dave, David Rush, who wasn't there at the start. You've got Martin Aldridge. I think Matt Murphy was around as well. I think Murphy played an important role at times. Um, you've got your two central midfield players. You've got Mickey Lou as well was around. You've got Bob. So we had, you know, we had nice cover as well. If people, Steve Woods, you know, if people became unavailable for whatever reason. But the team has changed a bit. The take like Chris has come out of it. Bobby Ford's come out of it. So a bit of the flair looks like it's come out of the team and we've become quite workmanlike. Go on then, Martin. Surprise us with your question. Yes. Okay. What was the extraordinary fact 
Bad Rocks with six goals against the Shrews. At last, I know. Yeah, I think I think I know that actually. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure, pretty sure most people who were there would know it. We do an alphabet, is it? Or is it? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the table with two games to go. We're still outside the top two. Two go up, obviously, um, automatically. Next four in the playoffs. We are two points off Blackpool, who are really struggling at this point. Their their formers since we beat them, their form has fallen off a cliff edge. Um, I was starting to believe. I genuinely believed at this point. But we had a really tricky match coming up at Crew. Fordy, tell us about the build up to that match at Crew. Um, so if you look at our fixtures that we've had, they've been difficult ones. You know, we played Swindon, Blackpool. Crew, obviously going to crew through at Wrexham. So, you know, we're not playing teams in and around the bottom that we're expected to dispatch easily. Um, it was, I think it was about do our job. If Blackpool mess up, if Blackpool are unable to get their result um, and we don't get our result, we'll be devastated. So just get our result, um, which we did. We did. Um, and, and again, one thing I remember about that one is we, I think we went, did we go two up and then they got a goal back? We're, we're going to see it in a minute, Fordy. Okay. But yeah. they get a free kick at the end at 2-1 and on the edge of the box. The fella bends it in and Phil doesn't go for it. And, and we like, and he goes, it was indirect. So <laughs> to be that calm in that situation with a few minutes left, letting the ball go in because he knows it's indirect, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. To step in for the historian before we watch the game, I can't remember why, but crew didn't make it all ticket. So Oxford fans went, the pubs were rammed from about 11 o'clock uh, and the away end and the areas we could get in was absolutely full the minute they opened the gate. Everybody queued, got in, rammed with away fans. It wasn't so busy for the home fans. So it was absolute chaos getting in there, but an hour and a half before the game to make sure we got in, everybody did. And I can tell you Blackpool were away at Walsall this day because the minibus that, uh, that I was in um, stopped at Warsaw Supporters Club after their result on the day. Run VT, Mr Curtis. What a game this was. I still say this is the best game of football I've ever been to. It was unbelievable. There's the, the instant Fordy talked about, the indirect free kick. Who was sent off for us, Martin? Didn't we have somebody sent off that day as well? Uh, very possibly, I can't remember. Not in the highlights. I'm pretty sure it's Stuart Massey. I think it's Stuart Massey. It could have been Stuart, Stuart played the following week. Gilly, maybe? I'm sure it was Massey. Massey did play the next week, but possibly the, the, the suspension was put off a bit, maybe. I don't know. But we definitely went down to 10. Um, and then they pulled a goal back, as we've just seen. And then there was the free kick that Fordy talked about. But it was just the most unbelievably brilliant game of football. Um, and all the, all the while, Blackpool were losing at Walsall. Yeah which no one expected. We also had nothing to play for. We, we didn't know that, actually. We, we came in, we came into the dressing room, and again, tiny dressing rooms, and we had some sort of music machine, and we had the results coming through on Radio 2 or whatever it was in M days, and they read the score out. I, went, oh, I, I just said, quite lads, listen to this again, and they repeated the score, and we went, right, we've got a job to do next week. Best game I've ever seen, without doubt. So, last day of the season, I was at a wedding. There's Hannah Woodley, who worked in the ticket office after that with her face painted there. Come on, Dan, sorry. I was at a wedding. I didn't go to this. I was at a bloody wedding where I sat next to Dean Windass's cousin, bizarrely. Um, yeah, I, was, I didn't go to this game, so I cannot talk about it at all. Somebody tell, Somebody fill in the details for me. Well, we have to leave it to the man who played in the game, surely. Mm. It was. Well, they um, go on. I think we, I think we felt a little bit of pressure. I do because it was now in our hands. Prior to that, we'd been chasing. I think chasing's easier. Um, so we created enough chances, I think, in the first half to have taken the lead and, and go at half time. And it wasn't complete silence, but it was quiet. It was, we've come this far, we're not going to blow it, are we? We just needed something to ignite everything, ignite us, 
like the crowd. Um, you know, whilst Peterborough were at nil nil, <coughs> play for, they felt like they could ruin the party, and, and I would be the same. I would be exactly the same. Can we ruin this party? Um, and obviously, Joey takes the corner, and now the legendary striker that is Frazioli heads it into the uh, net, and it was almost like taking the lid off a pressure cooker for everybody, players, supporters, staff, whoever it was, this now lifted. Pressure, nice gone. pressure gone, right, we ain't going to concede, <laughs> let's get this win again. Giuliano Grazioli it was, who... Uh... Yeah. Ken Charlie got the flick on. Ken Charlie flicked on the finish. That near post corner we worked on all season, that was it. I mean, look, look at the effort Stuart's made just to keep it in play for Moose to come and score. Yeah, I'm not, yeah. That's yeah. another one of those looks at Moose, what you're doing. <laughs> See, most, most centre halves when they go up for a corner, run back. Matt used to stay up. Just never used to run back. So I run back for him. So that, that's why he, he, he's ended up getting that, that third goal. And then put, someone's put this on a plate for Rushy and <laughs> him. lovely finish, lovely finish. And, and then it, it's party time. It's party time. I've got, I've got, honestly, I've got goose pimples on the back of my neck now. We were just about to hear from uh, Stuart Massey and Dennis Smith here, actually. Yes, I mean, Stuart's, Stuart's speech is from so passionate, from the heart, emotional. Yeah. That's what it's all about. 46 games and we've done it by right. No one's going to take that away from us. 15 games we've gone. We've won 12. 13 even, drawn two and lost one. We deserve this and we're going to enjoy First it. Division. That's right, and we deserve it. Get, Get in, in there. there. <laughs> Where did you end up, Fordy? The Standard or down in town? Where were you? Everywhere. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um, I, I can't Dennis remember. I can't remember. Um, Here's Dennis, so hold on. Well, it's been a long time, basically, in the wilderness for me. I mean, I, since I left Sunderland, where people were talking about me being the England manager to, to uh, winning something again or achieving something again. So it, it's, um, it's very pleasing. I mean, I've never lost faith in my own ability and I always believed in what I could do. So it's a first step back up on the ladder and hopefully next season we'll, we'll go and achieve something in the first division because we're not going up there to make the numbers. The next England manager, as he was now known for forevermore, did you ever tease him about that, Fordy? Did he get any stick about that from the players? Um, Behind his back. He wasn't, he wasn't in the room when we were saying it. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, I thought for, for me, I can't speak on behalf of the others, but obviously if you manage a team to a promotion, you pro, pro, as a manager, you've probably got most of those players on your side. But when, when he made me captain, when Jim left to, to go to Southampton, I, I thought he was going to give it to Matty. And I probably think everyone else thought he was going to give it to Matty. And he called me and he sat me down and he explained, when he said it to me, you know, it was almost like, you know, welling up uh, in my eyes. And then he explained why he thought it was good for me to, to be a captain. And um, it, it really gave me a, a confidence boost that he was saying that about me as an individual. And, and Dennis, at that point in my career, was brilliant. He, he just he just knew he needed to nudge me now and again, and the occasional come and have a chat. He didn't. I, I could just get on and do what I needed to do. I could train well. And he had a group of players. Recruitment's really important. He had a group of players that were very similar. He didn't have to cajole them very often and get them motivated. You know, that team at the end was, was quite different to the team that started, because the team that started with lots of flair and pace and the red arrows wouldn't have finished second, but, but that team did. Um, so Dennis does deserve a, a huge amount of credit for, for getting that team from where it was, that mediocre mid-table going nowhere position to finishing second and spending a week in the altar. Which we can't talk about. Well, go on, give us one story. Give us one story for the... He's done um, the postcard story, you don't? 
No, no, no. Okay, so, funny enough, we weren't the only football team there. There was quite a few. There was Preston and Mia, and and we found we found this little bar which was quite nice. Just not not quiet, but it was just quite nice, and we sat in the same seats every day. And, and one day, Derby County turned up. So a few of their players, and obviously banter flying around. And then it got down to who was the best drinkers. And Phil Whitehead said, well, you're not going to out-drink us. You've got no chance. And then somebody from their team went, well, you ain't going to out-drink us. So at this point, neither of us could leave. So they had to sit there all night, and we had to sit there all night. <laughs> and it got So we'd been there since about 10 o'clock. It was like 11 o'clock at night, and we're all thinking, oh, my God, I need to get away from here. We've been here for like all day. And eventually, they went, anyway, lads, it's been great. We're off. And we're like, yeah, you can't, you know, we and as soon as they had gone around a corner, we went around the other corner because we'd had enough. <laughs> it was, it was, um, it was great. It was, it was nice to be able to celebrate with a group of people you spent all year with, trying to achieve the same thing. And um, I think doing it in the way we did, coming so late, um, not expected. Probably we didn't even expect it. Um, I, I think it was really nice. Just a real nice end to that season who are the great characters of this team i mean if you could have two round for dinner now which two would you choose uh stuart massey brilliant i was trying to find him on twitter the other day actually i want to say hello to you i've spoken to him for a while um he he was we didn't have a take him when he first came in we didn't we thought well, is he is he being funny is he being patronizing is he just a bit of a weirdo brilliant Top lad, absolutely top, top lad. And then the second one probably would be the fella would be Phil, Phil Wade. Um, Because although if you speak to him, he, he reckons he could take stick, he couldn't. He used to bite all the time. Um, so that would be quite nice to get a nibble out of him again. But if I had a table big enough, I'd invite him all around. Hopefully soon. Hopefully soon. Yeah. yeah, you'll break COVID rules if you do that, don't you? Final oh, question oh. of the quiz. Uh, how many goals did Mike Ford score during the 95-96 season? Martin, surely Mike Ford himself has the, the edge in this question over me. You might have thought so, but let's find out. Well, no, I've known him 20 years. No, he doesn't. <laughs> we well, didn't yeah. score any in the highlights we've seen. No, he did. Dorchester. 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 Oh yeah, he did. Yeah, set up a lot though, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> do you remember when we did the Chris Allen goals, and you said double figures or single? Yeah. Could we do the other yeah. mm. way around? <laughs> I reckon you scored more goals for Oxford United than Chris Allen. I know the answer to that because yeah, if you saw the, if you go back to the start of this podcast, there's a, a graphic which tells us how many goals Mike, Mike Ford scored oh, for. I don't pay any attention to that. But just off the top of my head, I would be disappointed if I didn't get more than Chrissy. Yeah. You did, Fordy. You did. Okay, good. You were there though for a long time, right? <laughs> <laughs> as we as we saw from those haircuts. All right. Before we do the answers. Here's a new feature for this one. Um, Mike, you can be the judge on this, okay? This is the goal of the season. Oh, is this like Britain's like got talent? Oxford's, Oxford's got talent. We're going to do goal of the season. How many are there? Three. Here's Bobby Ford against Carlisle. I put it in just because I love Bobby Ford, really, but that's a great bit of skill. Second favourite Ford. Here's Matty Elliott against Carlisle. Yeah. And last but not least, Joey against Blackpool. Judge Ford, what are you going to go for? I'm going to go with Joey. I agree with the judge's verdict on yeah, that. Yeah, I, I mean, just, I mean, Matty's goal was crucial, really was crucial, and what a strike from the centre half. But 
Joe, Joey's goal is almost as important as the Grazioli header. Not as important, but almost, because we beat the league leaders and it just gave us that extra lift to go where it, it was a really tight game. A really tight game between two good sides. One goal was going to win it and what a finish. It's official. The goal of the season was Joey Beecham. Have we got to go through through Martin's silly quiz now and do the silly quiz? Yep. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. So, starting off at the beginning, first question Christy Allen scored the opening goal of the season against Chesterfield. How many goals in total did he score for Oxford United? 17. Okay. I was going to go 12. How many? I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing as well. 15, I'm guessing. Oh, okay, I'll go 12 then. So I was going to go 15, I'll go 12. Uh, the answer is 20. Did he really? Yeah, apparently so. Okay, oh. next question. Uh, we have two points. Uh, so the 9-1 win against Dorchester uh, remains United's biggest margin of victory since the club joined the Football League. What is United's best win since turning professional in 1949? And what is the club's biggest win in its history? Absolutely no clue. I thought I'm you might say that. 11, 11 something. There must, be, there must be a double figures result somewhere. It must be. Right. Well, the biggest win since turning professional in 1949 actually came in December 1960 when we beat uh, Wisbeach, I think it's pronounced, 9 0. Um, the oh. biggest goal in the club's history was in January 1939 in the Oxford Senior League, beat Banbury Harriers 16 1. Yeah, but Banbury Harriers, they must have been an athletic club. It couldn't have been a football team. Yeah. Sure. yeah. I think they're the forerunners of Banbury Spencer, who then became Banbury United. Before oh, okay. Yeah. okay, cool. Uh, next question was uh, Swindon. What is United's best win against them? 5 0. 4 1. I, I hope it's double figures, but I don't know. <laughs> It'd be nice if it was. Unfortunately, yeah, Dan's right. It is 5 0 on the 7th of April 1992. Ah. Oh. 1992. Uh, 80, 82, sorry. 82. Uh, Burnley. Okay, this one, the interesting one. What makes the Burnley game when we won 5 0 unique in United's history? How does Dan Curtis know that? Go on. Because of the video, the Tim Russon video that I watched about 5,000 times. The answer is Paul Moody got a, a hat trick as a substitute. Must be the only time that we've had a hat trick from a yeah, substitute. Whenever you say an answer like that, there's a look of amusement on Martin, who's got another answer on his sheet there. Look. I wish I had, but unfortunately, he's right. Oh. Paul Moody's so, the only sub in United's history to score a hat trick. Is, he, is that right? Is it? Yeah. Oh, I'm uh, next question uh, Blackpool. Um, Joey's goal against Blackpool was voted the best ever goal scored at the Manor by Knights supporters. Uh, what other, other accolade did Joey win from a fans poll at the end of the decade? Was he player of the decade? He was. Player of the 1990s. You were harshly done by there, Michael. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you should have scored a couple more goals. Yeah, All those forms you filled in as well. And... <laughs> I put player of the century. Can I have half a point? No. Have a whole uh, point. <laughs> now, Shrewsbury, you should all know this one, probably, even Chris, maybe. What was the extraordinary fact about Oxford's six goals against the Shrews? They were all headers, weren't they? Correct. All six goals came from a headers. I've just realised you're wearing glasses. I can't see them with all the fur on your face. It's like what's in a badger. <laughs> the new badger wearing glasses, I've just realised. Yeah. Oh, we've been at this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're very subtle, you know, you wouldn't mm. notice. Uh, and the final question, um, how many goals did Mike Ford scoring score during the 1995-96 season? Fordy, over to you. Well, I, sc I scored one, at, I'm sure I scored one at Peterborough. I scored one in the last minute against Rotherham. I scored against Dorchester, that's three. I'm going to go with four because I can't remember the other one. <laughs> I've written yeah, down four. I've written down three. I don't know if that's... Well, the answer is three. 
<laughs> you beat and poured it his own question there, Dan. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, have, I think I must have had one disallowed, but if VAR had been in, in place, it, <laughs> it was actually four, but yeah. yeah. Countless number of assists, so. Yeah. Jerry Price claimed it or something. To, to come, to bring us to a, a, a grinding conclusion, last season, last um, podcast, we talked about the relegation when we dropped out of the Football League, and it was it depressed the, all three of us for so long, we've not done one of these for two weeks. Um, I hope fans realise why we had to do it. To then get a promotion season like this and talk about it, it's put an enormous smile on my face. Fordy, if you had to sum that season up, or the people involved in it, I mean, Overall, the uh, uh, how would you describe that one season? I think um, I think as I said, we we were, so if you talk about halfway through the previous season to halfway through this one, we'd gone twelve months being basically average, being a mid-table team, not scoring enough goals, not getting enough points, and and for us to, you know, it's 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 still quite vivid although it's 20 odd years ago. Um, and Stuart Massey probably, when he talks about we deserve it, when he talks about we, I think he means everybody. He doesn't just mean we as in players. He means we as in the town, the city, the support, everybody associated or has a link to Oxford, we've done it. So we're not a fantastic, you know, we're not a massive football club that gets 30,000 people every week. We get our hardcore, we get the ones that turn up week in, week out. Um, and like I say, when Shut says we, that was the we. It was everybody. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Martin, no thanks to you for the quiz. Dan, thank yeah. you for putting all of this together. Fordy, you remain an absolute legend. The minute we can get back to games, uh, look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, just to finish, this programme's for a friend of me and Mike, who we know is going to watch this. We hope it leaves you smiling, mate. See you all next time.